So, as promised, this afternoon I wanted to talk a little bit about cultivating the positive emotions. And by positive, we don't mean that one is better than another, but we mean that these emotions will conduce to the benefit of you and other people. So these are emotions such as love, joy, kindness, gratitude, forgiveness, peace. My teacher always says peace is an emotion. You know, it seems like something very still, very stable. Maybe you don't see a lot there at first, but it actually deepens and grows. So it's something dynamic. You can actually say it's a very positive emotion. The whole path towards deep samadhi can be seen as a path of emotions, of skillful use of emotions, a cultivation of the wholesome. So what we talked about earlier was more about how to deal with more troubling emotions, more difficult things, the things that we tend to eject and push away. And that's never the answer. You know, rejecting and pushing things away doesn't enable us to meet them and to learn from them. So the Buddha said there are four right efforts, and the first two are around restraining and keeping away these negative emotions. But as we discussed earlier, that's not by you know, force or control, but it's by changing our attitude, changing our relationship to emotions. Yeah? The way we relate to them rather than you know, trying to control and get rid of and you know, create positive emotions out of a kind of force. You know, that's never really going to work. Yeah? And then he said at the same time, we have to learn how to develop and cultivate the wholesome emotions and also how to maintain them. This is quite distracting. I think I'll hold it. <laughs> yeah. So how to maintain the positive emotions as well. Is that okay? You still hear me? Very good. So we want to cultivate and also preserve. So first of all, of course, this involves a certain amount of wisdom as to which emotions actually lead to our benefit and to others' benefit. So again, it's motivated by compassion, you know, always about ending suffering and coming out of, you know, stress. And yet, it's really important not to create a duality around these are the kind of good emotions and these are the bad ones. And we can do this by understanding that every emotion is an opportunity to develop this very um, beautiful, loving presence and open awareness, yeah? And also that sometimes the so-called difficult emotions can actually be transformed into positive, wholesome ones because they all contain a kind of power yeah? And in a way, it's about just learning how to harness that power and see the other side of it. So one example that I like to think about is um, stress. How many people have experienced stress? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, And I also had quite a stressful week, feeling quite tired and that I had too much to do and all these kind of emotions. And then I read a, a very lovely quote by Eckhart Tolle, and he contrasted stress with enthusiasm, which was really interesting. And he said that stress is something that zaps your energy, whereas enthusiasm builds it. But inside stress, somehow, there is an element of enthusiasm. It's just that stress is a kind of um, wanting to be further ahead than you are at this moment. And because of that, you're not able to be fully present. And that's where the stress arises. You want to be somewhere that you're not. You want to be 10 steps ahead, whereas actually you're with this step that you're with right now. And it's that stress in between the two which is the suffering. Yeah? My teacher, Adrian Brown, always says that suffering is the gap between where you are and where you want to be. So this really correlates nicely with that. And of course, the answer has to be wanting to be where you are, right? And so I have to practice with this quite a lot with the project that I'm doing um, which is to develop a nuns monastery in England. I was reminded recently that it's Women's Day today, and that doesn't include the men or anyone else who doesn't maybe I identify as male or female. There are a lot of gender non-binary people too these days, and everybody's very welcome. So, But today is Women's Day, which is quite lovely, because I'm talking about my project, which is to try and give women the opportunity to take the full ordination, as monks have had since the time of the Buddha, and women didn't have for the last thousand years. So, yeah, something about the female wisdom as well around how to handle emotions is very important and, and quite different from the traditional way of, you know, pushing things away and being afraid of. You know, for women often, all we want to do is be heard. 
if we have difficult emotions. We just want somebody to hear us and say, I get it, I understand. Yeah. And sometimes, at least with my teacher, he tries to kind of fix the problem. And it's like, can you just hear me first of all before the solution comes? <laughs> but anyway, that's a kind of digression. <laughs> But these wholesome emotions are a very powerful thing, and they can start just by the way we relate to things, yeah? So with my project, if I remind myself that where I am is good enough for now and that the step I'm taking now is really important, then I put all my attention into that and all my energy into that, and I can redevelop this enthusiasm rather than it leaking into the future and leaking into stress, yeah? Another interesting thing I um, learned through the process of um, giving teachings, because I was kind of thrown in the deep end, as monastics often are, was that um, whenever I was feeling nerves about giving a talk or about you know, just turning up somewhere, um, I, would, I would feel quite weakened in a way and, and start to react, like feeling, oh dear, maybe this means it's all going to go wrong. And after a while, I realized that these nerves were, in a way, connected to the care that I had about being able to serve. So in a way, it was a nervousness that was arising because I really did have this genuine wish to try to express something that would be of benefit and help to others. And so when I started to see this beautiful um, quality that was behind it, I could more readily embrace the nervousness and the anxiety. And I started to see it differently, almost as a kind of adrenaline. So my relationship with that nervousness changed and I actually started to be able to welcome it and think, oh look, here they are, there's an energy here, it's an adrenaline that wants me to do well. And it could propel me into being able to give more and give more fully. Because if we never feel nerves, in a way we might not be that motivated or maybe we've stopped caring so much about you know, the quality of what we bring forward. So things like courage, you know, are never an absence of fear or an absence of nerves and anxiety. It's more about being able to act despite that, you know, and actually staying in contact with that. You know, this beautiful word vulnerability, which I think is really special. I, I think it's a very deep strength to be able to be vulnerable and yet go out and meet people, you know, show up, basically, with your vulnerability. And to be honest about it, to be able to say, you know, I'm feeling vulnerable today, but I wanted to come and meet you, or I wanted to come to work anyway, or come to the retreat anyway, you know, and just see if I could find a sense of being able to hold that, and a sense of being safe with that. And it's very beautiful when we can, because then we give others the permission as well to be vulnerable, you know. Always trying to put on a brave face is not the answer. So these so-called difficult emotions can be a great source of um, strength and can, if you can connect with what's underneath them, there's a way to bring out the beautiful element. Yeah? So also, um, the Buddha talked about the gradual training and um, in a way it's like a whole um, tool plate, if you like, or a whole army of ways to develop wholesome happiness and to up your happiness levels to another level. <coughs> And um, in the gradual training, it always starts with virtue, virtuous conduct. And I think often in Buddhist groups or maybe in the world at large, we tend to have a little bit of a negative uh, relationship to things like virtue and morality because it's of the way it's maybe been taught in other religions as a kind of list of do's, do's and don'ts. But the way the Buddha taught it was more like a gradual training and a cultivation of beautiful qualities. So sure, he emphasized the things not to do, but he also emphasized how to cultivate the opposites. You know, so instead of killing or harming another, he said, you know, put down your rod and weapon and, and act with compassion, yeah? trembling with compassion for the welfare of others and protecting others, even with your life. In the Metta Sutta, it says, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, we should develop such loving kindness to all beings and that's really an attitude of protecting others. Yeah? So the way we use our speech, it's not just about not lying, but it can also be about speaking out against injustices or against discrimination. You know, being an ally for people in marginalized groups. Yeah? Or speaking out about climate injustice and trying to effect change. So it doesn't have to be something passive. You know? And sometimes these things may start with anger and frustration, but if we can connect with what's underneath that, often it's a very deep care and concern and compassion. 
you know, for ourselves, for the planet, for animals, for all of life. And if we can harness that, then I think the energy is much purer because anger always zaps our energy and obscures the mind. Yeah. So virtue is a lovely thing. And also in the suttas, the Buddha talks a lot about bringing up one's goodness. So not just remaining content to do good, but actually reflecting on that and remembering it and using it as a source of joy, a source of inspiration. I think sometimes it's hard. I mean, I see myself not doing it as much as I could. And maybe there's a sort of underlying fear that there would be ego involved in that and I shouldn't give myself too much praise. But it's actually the opposite of that. It's more of an encouragement to keep on doing good for yourself and others. Because then you're empowering your mind and you're giving yourself energy. There's been a lot of research, you know, to show that children learn best by not being punished but being encouraged. And it's the same for us. So we have to be careful with how we use our speech. How often do we use our speech in ways that's very blaming and critical when we could actually be praising others much more and praising ourselves? My teacher actually advised me to um, keep a list of things that people say which are encouraging and praising. And I actually followed his advice. And sometimes if I read that when I'm feeling down, it really turns things around for me. And I think, no, no, it's good to carry on even through difficult periods and with tasks that seem impossible. Because I realize that already this is bringing benefit to others, you know. Just from trying to cultivate the good and bring that forth in life is an inspiration for people, even sometimes people I've never met. You know, so we really can't underestimate the power of that. And the Buddha has a really lovely um, little quote here. It's about um, somebody who he calls a wise person. So it's just an example of how you can bring up the happiness. And, of course, you can use your own words, but these are reflections that we can do. So he says, When a wise person is on their chair or on their bed or resting on the ground, then the good actions that that person did in the past good bodily, verbal, and mental conduct, cover that person, overspread them, and envelop them. Just as the shadow of a great mountain peak in the evening covers, overspreads, and envelops the earth, so too, when a wise person is on the chair, or on his bed, or resting on the ground, then the good actions that they did in the past, good bodily, verbal, and mental conduct, cover, overspread, and envelop one. Then the wise person thinks, I've not done what is bad, what is wrong. I've not done what is cruel or what is wicked. I've done what is good. I've done what is wholesome. I've made myself a shelter from anguish. Isn't that nice? I really love that because so often we don't reflect on that. We only reflect on the things that went wrong and the things where we felt we failed. You know, but how often do we really bring up the things we didn't do wrong? How many of you stole today on the way here? (laughs) How many of you squished an ant or something? Intentionally, I mean. (laughs) So, you know, that's a pretty harmless lie. But we don't bring it up, and then we miss the joy that's connected with that. And the Buddha says that's called anavajasukha, a blameless bliss. He says it's the freedom from remorse and regret. And because we don't have this remorse and regret, the mind can settle much more readily into meditation. If you notice from that little quote that I read out, he also mentions mental conduct, and that's in a way the next step in the gradual training, because the Buddha also taught us to use our senses in a way that focuses on life, on situations, on other people, in a way that cultivates the positive qualities in our own mind. Yeah? So that means not looking always at the faults in another, but actually trying to see their good side, maybe trying to see where they were coming from, and even if they were coming from a very negative place, understand why. You know, perhaps their conditioning was such that they didn't have good role models. Yeah? Or perhaps they were just deluded at that time and they created suffering for themselves and for others. And as a result, they will suffer, you know? Because whenever we generate negativity in our mind, we're the first persons to know it. You know, immediately there's a drop in the happiness. We just sunk in suffering and in misery. And then we begin a battle with our own mind. It was interesting when I was preparing for this um, day because I spoke to my sister, who's not a Buddhist, and who I very rarely talk to about my own path because she's got two children, and I think, you know, when you've got children and you're a mother, it it kind of consumes your life. 
So we talk about them and we, you know, we walk in the nature together when we do see each other. But I just thought, let me tell her what I'm going to talk about. So I said, oh, I'm talking about emotional agility. What do you think that means? And to my amazement, she just started to talk about it. And it lasted about half an hour. She was just giving me this whole beautiful reflection on what emotional agility meant to her. And I was really quite blown away, you know, because you don't have to be a Buddhist to understand your emotional world. And she said something to me along the lines of, I think I've found a tool for life, she said. I've learned how to frame things in a way that is good for me and good for the people around me. She said, you can't live under the judgment of other people. You know, at work, I think something had happened. She'd been put forward. She's a teaching assistant and um, a really good one, actually. She should be getting a teacher's salary, but unfortunately she's not. She's probably being exploited a bit. Um, so the principal of the school put her forward to do some kind of um, forestry course or, or something that she could do outdoor activities with the kids and some other colleagues found out about it and felt quite envious and jealous and she said she noticed it because there were all these kind of whispers and looks you know, coming her way and they complained to the principal to the extent that she was actually taken off the course and they, they, um, yeah, they didn't allow her to go through with it anymore because the others were feeling jealous about it and her attitude was really impressive. She just said, well, you know, that's just where they're at. You know, I don't want to be that way. I mean, if they want to go on a course, they're welcome to go on any course. I want people to do whatever supports them, you know. And she said, you can't live your life worrying about other people. I'm just going to live the way I want to and keep smiling, even if they look at me back with a grumpy face. I just want to show up in that way. And I said, gosh, how did you learn that? And actually, this, I hope she doesn't listen to this recording, but part of it was living with a, a husband who she doesn't always get along too well with and just having to learn to look at the positives in that person, you know, and to notice what she does have. A very responsible, very reliable husband, you know, very loyal. And, yeah, sure, sometimes it's difficult, but relationships is where you meet your edge, isn't it? And so she's found this way, just without reading any Buddhist teachings, to learn to look in a different way way at things, in a way that leads to this happiness and that stops her being a kind of victim of the people around her and other people's opinions. Yeah. And this is so great when we can free ourselves from what other people think, because most of the time it's not what anybody else thinks, it's what you think they think. And it's always about you, what you think they think about you when they're not even thinking about you. <laughs> you know. And if they are thinking about you, I mean, it's probably one thought in a thousand and they forgot about that a long time ago. You know. So people can't have a fixed perception of us really. I mean, I notice for myself my own thoughts about myself change every day, every moment sometimes. So how can I start to manage everybody else's? It's just crazy. <laughs> yeah, and I think this comes with maturity too you realise that nobody's really thinking about you anyway so why waste energy on that trying to control that yeah. the Buddha also taught these very skillful ways of learning to replace the negative thinking with positive thoughts Yeah, because it's not only our attitudes and perceptions but sometimes our thoughts are driving us mad and becoming really repetitive And you know, we, we tend to invest them with a lot of truth <laughs> and listen to them and they just persist and go on and on and on when our mind's not agile and he said that one really useful method with this is to substitute the thought for something different you know, often we have thoughts along the lines of I'm no good, I'm not good enough you know, I've never done anything I've never really succeeded in anything la 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 even though all your friends think otherwise so we can just learn to recognize that thought when it arises and just try and replace it. What about, I'm good enough as I am? You know, I'm good enough as I am. Does that resonate? Just get familiar with these other thoughts, other ways of thinking, you know, and listen into it. You have to be good enough as you are because you are the way you are. And you are the way you are because of all the causes and conditions that have led to this point. So you couldn't be any other way. But what you can do is appreciate your qualities and try and build on that rather than, you know, running yourself down and constantly undermining yourself. So it's learning to speak to ourselves as our best friends would speak to us. Hopefully you've all got someone close in your life that builds you up and sees the best side of you. And if you haven't, you have to become your own best friend. How would you like to be spoken to? 
how would you feel was you know a kind and compassionate way to speak to another person yeah because often the inner speech we just let it go we just think oh it doesn't matter nobody else can hear it but actually it does affect us body and mind yeah thinking is so connected to emotions isn't it so just learning to replace these thoughts is really helpful <coughs> another one that i heard from my teacher recently is that um was something along the lines of oh everybody's giving me a really hard time you know we can have that kind of thought everybody's just giving me a hard time and he said how about reframing that as people are giving me the opportunity to have a hard time <laughs> that's really good isn't it i like that they're giving me the opportunity to have a hard time but it's up to me whether i actually take that opportunity yeah i don't have to make their hard time into my hard time so separating ourselves a little bit from you know what we think other people are doing to us because you'll realize that that thinking is really quite self-centered and most of the time it's not about you at all mm. so this is the way we can start to use our thoughts and perceptions in skillful ways and it's not again selfish it's not deluded you know basically our perceptions are never going to be completely accurate until we're enlightened right we're not really seeing things in line with how they are as long as the five hindrances are still there yeah five hindrances are like uh, anger or negativity aversion yeah craving craving or desire wanting wanting things to be different wanting what we don't have or yeah wanting something that we'll never get and then doubt tiredness sleepiness anything that makes the mind dull and unclear and the last one is restlessness and worry So the Buddha said all of these things obscure the mind. They bend the truth. It's like you've got curtains between you and the reality. So you can't really see things clearly. Or things seem very distant and dim. It's like the lights aren't turned on fully in your mind. So you get the kind of shape of something but you can't see the detail. And he also said that the hindrances distort perception and they nourish delusion. you know just in the same way that if you see a lake and there are ripples on that lake and you look at your reflection you don't see a clear reflection it's distorted because the lake's not still so whenever we have these negative or any kind of uh, yeah hindrances in the mind we're not seeing things as they are anyway so you know and it's very hard to completely overcome those unless we're in really deep states of samadhi what what are called the jhana states So if perceptions anyway distorted why can't we use our perception in a skillful way mm-hmm. maybe that person is a mixture of you know wholesome and unwholesome qualities but you can look at them in a way that brings out the wholesome and whatever you see in another tends to be what they show you back in the end anyway right so the more you look at the good and praise the good rather than criticize the faults that's what they'll show to you and that's what will be encouraged in that person so you can do that you don't actually have to point out other people's faults but you can praise them when they do the good things not only what you'd like them to do but sometimes it may be thank you for doing the ironing or you know thank you for going down to the shops and you you ignore it when they don't do that you just ignore it hmm? so things become a much more playful and fun in that way and so then the buddha said when we've learned to use our perceptions in these ways and we've undermined these hindrances then we're ready to cultivate the wholesome qualities because we've already got quite a stable mind and there's quite a bit of happiness there yeah so our minds have come to a point of balance and i'm pretty sure actually that if my sister sat down to meditate one day she'd probably be in quite a good position to to make a good start i think because of all the work she's done at home you know even off the cushion even without being a practitioner that foundation is there the same with a lot of people from um, buddhist countries not always but often the seela is there the virtue is there as a foundation and so when people learn the meditation it's quite easy they take to it quite easily and some of the problem with us i think as westerners coming to the path at least the westerners who are here who are maybe not from um buddhist backgrounds or who haven't you know um been brought up with certain virtues or i mean drinking is a very common one in in the west right which yeah we don't have to condemn it as morally wrong but it does cloud the mind sometimes we think that meditation is going to solve everything and we neglect to do a lot of the work that we can be doing in daily life so it becomes much more difficult when you sit down and the mind is you know kind of agitated from your maybe less than skillful conduct 
So the Buddha said at this point the hindrances are really, really minimized and we can actually start to cultivate. So basically we're now at the point where you could pick up an object such as the breath or maybe metta meditation, yeah, the Brahma Vihara meditation. Does everybody know what that is? Loving kindness, compassion, joy, sympathetic joy and equanimity. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about the metta meditation because that's where you can really start cultivating a garden of flowers. Yeah? My teacher always says, don't water the weeds, water the flowers. And the metta meditation is like having a whole garden full. It's just such a beautiful practice. So loving kindness means a kind of um, unconditional, protective, altruistic kind of love. And it doesn't have to be seen as something extremely exalted. It can start with just a simple friendliness and well-wishing to all beings, regardless of whether you get along with that person or whether your well-wishing and care is reciprocated or not. So it's something much more unconditional than the kind of affection that we may feel towards friends and family and people who we like to be around. And it's more universal. Yeah? So the Buddha said it's like sun which shines impartially on all. It touches all beings, no matter where they are, who they are. And it doesn't demand anything back in return. So it's really unconditional. Yeah? And it can be an attitude of mind as well as a cultivation. So it can be just the way we regard others with this friendliness, the way we regard our emotional world with friendliness. And another aspect of uh, loving-kindness is that it's apamana, which means um, measureless. It literally means boundless, without any boundaries. Yeah? So it stretches to the entire world. And I like this word measureless because it means we don't measure others, we don't measure ourselves. <laughs> yeah? And the Buddha says that the mind becomes great, mahagata, gone to greatness. So it can encompass all beings. And it also breaks down the boundaries between ourselves and other people. You know? So it's a great healer of divisions. At the moment, this country seems to be quite divided in many ways. Actually, I, I wonder how much of that is the media, you know, because we can look for divisions or we can look for the unity, right? I mean, it's a very, very diverse group today, and it usually is, actually, whenever you teach the Dhamma, because all beings desire their own happiness. All beings want to live a life of kindness and develop wisdom in themselves, and this is what unites us. Yeah? So the loving kindness really breaks down these artificial barriers we erect between ourselves and other people because we just connect with that wish for all beings to be free and that all beings wish that for themselves. Yeah? So this becomes the focus of our mind. And so how do we practice loving kindness? <laughs> there are two different ways in the suttas. And... Um, the first one is like from the early Buddhist teachings, so all of these big books that you see me with from time to time, um, like the Pali texts. And in here, the Buddha talks about the metta as a kind of spreading it in different directions. So you just spread it to all quarters, he says, to the front, to the back, and all around. Yeah? And there's a simile of like a trumpet or a conch shell. In, in um, Tibet or Ladakh, where I've been, they have these big trumpets and they kind of blow them in the mornings as part of the um, Buddhist puja, the kind of offering to the gods or whatever it is. And you hear it literally all around the valley. You know, it spreads in all directions. And so this is a kind of spatial expansion of metta. We're just sending it out. But then the one that's a little bit more commonly taught is the one that comes from the Visuddhimagga, which are the commentaries on the text. And this is more of a systematic cultivation which goes through the various categories of beings. And it's quite nice because it means that you don't exclude anybody and you can really work at the emotional level with difficult things as well. So we start in this case with somebody who's maybe dear to us, maybe a person who's been a benefactor or a close friend or someone we just share a very natural and easy, loving, joyful connection with, so that it's easy when we think of them to develop feelings of goodwill. And we start with that person first. So it's almost like you want to build a fire, and you start with the kindling, first of all, because if you put the wet, sappy log on, it'll never get started. Right? But then as that fire starts to grow, starts to flourish, you can use somebody that's a little bit more difficult, you know, and I still think, I mean, at this point you can bring yourself in if you want to. It depends on your relationship with yourself. 
Sometimes in traditional practices, we start with ourselves. But I tend to feel that we have probably a little bit too much self-criticism to start with ourselves. And even for myself, I find it easier to start with a loved person or a benefactor, a teacher. So after this, we, we go on to the neutral person. So it may be somebody who we don't really know that well or we don't have particularly strong feelings for, maybe no affection in particular. Perhaps you've only seen them a few times, could even be your neighbour or somebody in the shop. And we start to develop those same feelings of well-wishing towards them. And gradually, when that fire grows, we can move on to the difficult person. But not too soon, because otherwise it really is like putting that wet log on the fire. It just goes out. But if the fire's burning strongly, you can put almost anything on there, and the fire continues. It can even get stronger, because it has to muster more strength in order to meet that big, fat, sappy log. Yeah. So this is how we start. So it moves from a kind of discursiveness, so we use thinking in a very skillful way, you know, as we were talking about substituting the negative thought for something positive. So may you be happy, may you be free from suffering, may you be peaceful, or whatever thoughts you want to use for that person. And in between those thoughts, we just connect with our own heart, with our own emotional world, you know, it may be a sensation in the body somewhere, it can be the heart area or anywhere in the body. And just listen in to how that feels, how that reverberates in your own body mind. Yeah? And so we're kind of inviting this feeling of metta, this emotion of metta, to develop by using thinking in a directed way. And then gradually moving to non discursiveness. So we move from the thinking into just the pure emotion of metta. And it always carries a positive, like wholesome, um, warm and pleasant feeling. Metta is always something pleasant. And in this way, it's really, really helpful in developing deep states of samadhi. Yeah? One of the benefits that the Buddha talks about is that the mind easily becomes concentrated. And I try to veer away from the word concentration because I think it's much more of a settling and a stilling than a kind of um, narrow concentration. The mind does get absorbed in its object, but it's a very spacious and gentle absorption. Yeah? And he said that it becomes still easily this way because one of the reasons is it's so pleasant. Yeah? And the Buddha said that happiness is the um, proximate cause for stillness. It's the immediate cause for stillness and for getting deeply settled in your meditation. So meditation isn't a process of pain and suffering. It's actually a process of refining happiness yeah, and gradually being able to settle because you feel more and more at ease with the moment, more and more at ease with your mind. Yeah. So this is one really beautiful benefit of the loving kindness, just that it carries this lovely aspect of happiness and warmth yeah, that maybe doesn't always come around through using breath meditation. But one of the tricks I like to use is actually to start the um, metta meditation until to the point where I get this very um, nice feeling coming up, which the Buddha calls piti. Piti means like rapture, like happiness. It's a wholesome kind of happiness. And then put it onto the breath if I want to do you know, breath meditation. So you get a kind of kick start, a kind of jump start with the practice because you already have this feeling of well-being. Yeah. And it's not only for the sake of happiness that we practice these things like metta. There's also a lot of wisdom to be gained. The first thing is that we do overcome these hindrances, you know, especially ill will through the practice of metta. And the less hindrances are present in our mind, the more possibility it is to see things clearly. Yeah? The less the hindrances, the more clear seeing becomes possible to us. Because, again, it's not distorted. Our perceptions are not distorted by wanting or yeah, aversion. And another really beautiful thing about the metta is that you start to see that perception is really conditioned. You know, you, the mind of metta sees life very differently from a mind which is tired and grumpy. It sounds really simple, but it's easy to forget. You know, sometimes I wake up with a headache feeling like I really don't want to have all these emails to do and this admin with my project and volunteers to organize and event venues to search and all sorts of stuff. 
And, you know, I notice that my mind state is not very um, positive. And then I project that into the future. And I think, oh, gosh, it's always going to be like this. I'm going to be worn out by the time I'm 50. You know, I'll have to retire. <laughs> and even I can look into the past and think, life's always been really difficult for me. It's been a struggle, blah, blah, blah. And that's simply because I woke up in a little bit of a grumpy, tired mood. If I contrast that to a mind of metta, you know, feeling very at ease, feeling resourced, life looks really different. When I feel in that mood, all my work looks really joyful. I think, gosh, this is so great. I'm going to find this venue. People are going to come to the talks. They're going to get all this benefit, you know, and this project's going really well. Only four years and we've already got a base. You know, we've already got some support and some funds in the bank. And my whole life looks different in a state of meta meditation. So this is really worth kind of um, exploiting for the sake of wisdom <laughs> when we start to see how reality changes due to the way we observe it. And not only that, we actually observe different things depending on the quality of our awareness. So I'll just give you one more example, then we'll do some meditation. <laughs> But um, this was a couple of years ago on Rain's Retreat in Australia. Um, and it was just before my personal retreat. So for the personal retreat, I spend basically two weeks in complete solitude in a cottage. And I do all the walking meditation inside and sitting meditation and just try and keep the mind really, really calm. And somebody brings food to the cottage, so I don't even have to go out, which is wonderful. And the first evening of that retreat, I remember something coming up, like some kind of sadness that I wasn't sure what it was about. And I was doing walking meditation, and I just realized I need to send some compassion and some metta to myself. And so I started just imagining that I was like holding my feet and massaging my own feet, and that my teacher was holding my head and just giving me all this attention while I was doing the walking meditation. And I just developed some really lovely words, you know, like, oh, it's okay, darling, or something. Some kind of soothing words to myself. And, yeah, and there were a few tears, and, and I felt like something was being processed, but I didn't feel like rushes of loving kindness or anything like that. But I remembered that that day I'd been meditating in my room, and I'd be hearing all this banging on the roof because there's these kind of um, tin roofs. And I think when the sun shines on it, it starts to expand, and it's like, boom, all of a sudden, while you meditate. And I noticed myself getting a little bit irritated and thinking, gosh, this is really loud. I've got to sit in here for two weeks. You know, I don't know if this is going to work. It keeps disturbing my meditation. And I was having all these thoughts projecting into the future. But then the next day, after I did this loving-kindness meditation in the walking period, I was sitting in my room and I noticed the bang but there was no response. I, I didn't feel at all irritated by this. And I just carried on with my meditation, and I was getting quite into it. The mind was quite steady, quite peaceful. And about one or two hours passed, and at the end of that I realized not only was I not being irritated, I actually hadn't noticed the noise anymore. It had completely gone from my radar screen, dropped off <laughs> the screen of awareness. I just wasn't noticing it. And I find this really interesting, you know, that what we observe is actually, what we notice is affected by the quality of our awareness. So we don't always go around picking up the problems, you know, when we have this mind that's resourced and that's happy and at peace. We tend to notice beauty. We notice silence, stillness, subtle happinesses that maybe are always there, but we just don't see because our minds are too coarse. Yeah? Yeah. So cultivation should never be thought of as some kind of suppression or something that's a little bit artificial. It's actually a really powerful insight practice, and it's part of the path. Yeah? So we develop these beautiful qualities. And a mind of metta is a mind that's forgiving. You know? It helps us to forgive old resentments, to make peace, to restore res relationships. You know? So often relationships are destroyed through anger, through greed, ill will, envy. Yeah, but when we develop qualities like loving kindness, sympathetic joy, being able to rejoice in others' good fortune, we overcome these negative tendencies to jealousy and resentment and holding grudges. Mm -hmm. 
So both are important to be able to hold these difficult emotions and meet them with loving kindness, meet them with a sense of curiosity and friendship, but also to keep on developing the wholesome and just making use of all the opportunities you have in life to do little acts of kindness and to maybe boost somebody, you know, praise them where praise is due. You don't always have to criticize people because they deserve it. And the same with yourself. So learning to talk kindly to ourselves. And again, the practice of loving kindness can really help to change those negative thoughts into something much more constructive and helpful.